inviting me here. It feels so good to be in this room and among friends and to be honoring the godmother of the water activism movement, Cindy Rank. Where's she? Oh, there she is. <laughs> we are all standing on her shoulders. And I am aware, no kidding, of Cindy every day. Every day, when I need some inspiration, when I need some persistence, I think of Cindy, I think of Don Garvin too, and they were good friends. Um, okay, water policy. I'm, uh, for those who don't know me, I'm with West Virginia Rivers Coalition. We've been around not as long as you all, but 35 years, and at our core has been water policy work, both in Charleston and DC. Um, and our, our, our newly adopted purpose is to um, advocate for clean and healthy waters for all. And we appreciate being a strong partner of West Virginia Highlands Conservancy in this effort throughout our existence and could not do it without you. We are powerful together. All right, I'm just gonna introduce what has been helpful for me in knowing the effective model that I've seen to affect policy change. And this is a grid that Van Jones gave to the environmental grant makers, so I did not invent this. But what you see across this x-axis of this grid is the idea of, of moving around from political concept to political action, and also the rational and the emotional up and down the line, these four quadrants all having to work together. So we spend quite a bit of time at West Virginia Rivers at the upper two quadrants. We work with folks like Evan Hansen at Downstream Strategies, who's done consulting with us on uh, policy research and analysis. We convene a water, statewide water policy work group that Highlands is a part of. And um, I, also sp I also am a registered lobbyist for over 20 years now, um, helping do the lobbying in the state house and, and, and creating those one-on-one -on -one relationships with lawmakers. Down in the bottom, equally important, we need storytellers to bring the need for policies to life. We need to make this personal for our decision makers. We also need an outside game where we are putting the pressure on them and holding them accountable to the decisions they make. So again, just wanted to introduce because I want, I invite you all to think about how Highlands contributes to this ecosystem of the movement that we are together. So I'm gonna do a little look back and then a little look forward. And I'm gonna talk about the water policy priorities for 2023 and, and just briefly touch on the outcomes. We had a pretty good year and people like, wow, you're in a pretty conservative legislature. Yeah, we are. <laughs> um, but we had some good things happen, at least incremental measures of success, okay? And that's very important when I try to explain how we do clean water environmental advocacy in West Virginia incremental progress is very important and to keep that long view in mind. So we, we've known for some time we have a crisis in West Virginia when it comes to oversight of the oil and gas industry. 2023, tw 10 inspectors at the Office of Oil and Gas within DEP um, overseeing over 75,000 wells, 30,000 tanks. Not enough, obviously. We did get an incremental progress when in, in the legislative session passed a bill that's going to increase, where they're in the progress of, of increasing their staff from 10 inspectors, doubling that to 20. Progress, still not enough. Public lands, this is where Highlands has been critical. Thank you, Luann and company. Um, as I think you're probably aware, one of the big threats of the legislature has been to expand the use of motorized vehicles on our state public lands. And not only, what was really, we did like this, I call it the ninja move. <laughs> there was very late in the regular session where with grassroots support, a strong outside game and a strong inside game, we got an amendment adopted on the House floor that instated this prohibition against further expansion of motorized trails in state parks, state forests, and rail trails. Now, yes, yes, big, big, big deal. It's on the books now, folks. Now, what's also on the books, there's the caveat, right? 
of connector trails. So we are monitoring closely because the same legislation also authorized connector trails from private motorized trails into state parks. And there's two they're looking at in the southern part of the state, Twin Falls and Chief Logan, to add these connector trails. So stay tuned. Um, our third priority was about around defending the Above Ground Storage Tank Act. That passed in 2014 after the, what was known as the West Virginia water crisis, where 30,000 West Virginians were suddenly um, without access to safe water for days and some, and some weeks due to this middle tank here that um, leaked something around 10,000 gallons or more of a cold cleaning chemical, toxic chemical called MCHM. The response to that, that happened the second day of the legislature. <laughs> so the, it was a moment of outrage. It was a moment where an issue of failure became very personal for a lot of people and everybody in that three, that nine county area, including the legislators themselves. Several of them had to seek medical attention due to exposure to this toxic chemical. Um, in response in 2014, a really strong water protection bill uh, passed, including this Above Ground Storage Tank Act. Since then, it has been chipped away year after year, uh, the past eight years. The good news is, is that further attempts in 21 and 22 by the oil and gas industry to get completely exempt from the act were defended against. Those bills failed in the Senate, and then there was no introduction of this bill in 2023. So that's a good sign. But we are not, we cannot sit on, <laughs> sit back because um, even as of this year, the West Virginia Manufacturers Association are saying it's a priority for them um, come 2024, 2025. So we'll have to stay vigilant on those efforts because all that's really left are protections, regulations within what are called zones of critical concern. These are these zones immediately upstream from public drinking water intakes. So the idea that it's most important to be protective in those zones, yet industry is still trying to deregulate within those critical zones. All right, I don't have to talk much about PFAS because y'all got the download on that. And it is scary and it is humongous and it is just the tip of the iceberg that we understand. This is going to be a problem, um, a very big problem, not only for West Virginia, but for the nation on how we deal with this. And what you're seeing again, as Luann showed you, is the map that we created that the red dots show where there were hits. These are detections of PFAS in places that we, we thought we'd see around the Eastern Panhandle and um, Ohio River, but a lot of places are mysterious. So what's going on in um, those places is going to be very important. And I, I will say just because incineration came up in the last conversation. There is an incinerator right about there, if you can see the laser pointer in Ohio, that is known to be incinerating PFAS materials. And there's going, you know, there needs to be investigation if that cluster there is part of the reason why they're seeing those hits um, right across the river. Um, if you Google DH, West Virginia DHHR PFAS, you'll get take to, taken to this map. It's an interactive map. What um, Mike was showing earlier about the data coming in around the finished water, because again, the red dots were raw water. This is finished water. This is what's coming out of the tap. The blue water drops that are colored in, that's where they have done finished waters testing. And if you go to the interactive map, you can click on those blue dots and find out the results, including in uh, Davis. So I'm not gonna spend much time here because y'all talked about it. I mean, what I will say is these state actions that have happened that we started back getting in motion in 2019 would not happen without public involvement, okay? This is like proof positive that citizen engagement and advocacy works. That statewide study, we wouldn't have that map if it weren't for citizens bringing this to the attention of the legislature. So that was that incremental step one. Um, coming to 2023, major victory of the session, the passage of the PFAS Protection Act. We were so underestimated on this, I don't think anybody thought we would pull this off. And we did in a bipartisan manner. We had like 11 sponsors in the Senate and about that in the House, um, uh, Republican leadership on it. 
And again, what was happening is that grassroots folks were calling their legislators, say, sponsor this bill. And it worked. It worked. Um, the PFAS Protection Act, I'll just point out something that hasn't been um, mentioned yet, is that it does require by the end of this year industry to self-report if they are using PFAS in their processes. So hopefully that'll give us more information about sources of PFAS. You heard um, Mike talk about the PFAS action plans. This is gonna be our next point of focus, um, is to make sure these action plans are done well, and they are done as the legislation intended to be, which is identifying and addressing PFAS at its source. So it's going back to all those red dots. There's 137 of them uh, um, involving 130 public water systems that will each have to have a PFAS action plan in place by the end of uh, 2026. They are gonna start with the first 37 where they saw the highest concentrations. Um, we are waiting to hear on a million dollar grant we, that DEP agreed to go in with us. It will be from EPA. Um, we should hear about the end of this month. It encourages um, community engagement in the development of PFAS action plans. Um, I'm hopeful that we'll get that grant. If we don't, I am concerned about the agency's capacity to do these well and, and to have the staff. They have not added any staff or dedicated uh, certain positions to developing these PFAS action plans yet. So another thing will be, um, a, a, again, a point of focus and a point where we hope that Highlands can help get the word out in those communities to get involved in, in the, um, again, keeping the, the lens on source identification and reduction. Because if we can reduce it at its source, then it, it eases the burden on water, the treatment pieces, which you heard have their own set of problems, um, and they cost a lot. And guess who pays for that cost? Not the polluters who cause the pollution, but we have to pay the price as consumers. Okay, shifting gears quickly. This is not a current legislative issue, but it was affected by legislation. <laughs> and Cindy Rank holds all the institutional knowledge and history on this. She has been working on this a long time. And to try to sum it up, it, it relates to 303D, which is a section of the Clean Water Act that requires states every two years to publish an impaired streams list. So they have to go through a statewide assessment of which streams and rivers are meeting water quality standards and which are not. And if they are not, they are determined to be impaired. This is important to get right because an impaired stream then gets a restoration plan and then gets access to funding, federal funding, to implement that restoration plan. And what has happened over time, and this is Highlands has been instrumental in holding government agencies to account on this issue through litigation and other means, is that DEP has, in my view, ignored or used methodology that is outdated and not as precise as it could be to basically ignore what EPA has identified as 1,600 miles of streams that aren't, that DEP did not deem impaired, but should be if you use the best avail available science and methodology. So right now, <laughs> that's why I wanted to mention to it, because I think we're getting an action alert out on Monday, the comment deadline to EPA to say, hey EPA, we've been asking you for a long time to get DEP to use the best science we support this, we support you in proposing these additions. All these red streams are what the, the streams that they're adding, okay? And these are streams that if you use the scientific methodology that EPA recommends, that we recommend, that Highlands has recommended, this is the more accurate view of actual impairments in West Virginia. And this is, these are the streams that will be added to be eligible for restoration plan and um, resources. So please, if, if you can, through your mechanisms, through your grassroots, generate comments by next Wednesday. That will be hugely helpful. This is going to be controversial. <laughs> it has been, and it will be again. Um, so we need to, we need to sort of rally, rally the troops on this. 
So just to um, highlight a few things coming up in, a, in addition to the 303D list comment deadline, we are hosting and want to invite and encourage West Virginia Highlands Conservancy to be a co-host in a 10-year remembrance anniversary event of the West Virginia water crisis I just met, believe it or not, 10 years, um, on January 9th, which is the day before the legislative session begins. Legislature, legislators will be in town. We're going to hold that on the state capitol grounds at the Culture Center, so please save that date. And Marilyn, we should talk about how to get you all involved in that. Um, another date, whoops, is February 13th to get on your calendar. It's the day where um, uh, all environmental groups in, in the um, state get together with under the umbrella of the West Virginia Environmental Council for a day at the legislature. It's, it's been growing in size and impact. Um, Mike Jones, my colleague, is working on getting more students there uh, this year, getting young people involved who have this passion for environmental policy. So it's a great day to come on down to Charleston and, and spend some time with us. Okay, a little look ahead. Um, this is still in development. Um, so those who are watching the recording on the internet, <laughs> please could be subject to change. Um, there has been a bill introduced that will be reintroduced this year called the Orphan Well Pre Prevention Act. And the idea is to update, modernize the bonding system for the oil and gas industry so that we are less vulnerable to them being able to walk away from their responsibilities. And in a minute, I'm gonna talk about, touch on a federal policy where there's now millions, billion, of dollars going into open orphaned well plugging because of this broken bonding system. So we're looking for a fix to prevent us from holding the bill when companies walk away. Community solar, I know is something Highlands is already aware of. That'll be back with more force and I think more momentum to hopefully uh, get past this year, next year and PFAS bans. So I was so glad to hear the conversation before because we are thinking about the next, you know, PFAS bans, is, 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 should we do that this year? I mean, we had a great victory in 2023. Do we wanna bring it back in now? I would say if there is enthusiasm and support from this group, that would help. <laughs> Um, there are a handful of states who have successfully passed bans of certain products. Um, it's not easy. I know, I know my colleague in California was talking about, so PFAS is in pizza boxes, okay? <laughs> it's in microwave popcorn. It's in a lot of, a lot of food packaging. So there's a, it's not easy to flip the switch when it comes to bans, but it is certainly needs to be part of the conversation for reasons you were earlier on solving the PFAS problem is let's stop introducing more of this into our environment. That is the only, yes, you, you tried it, that's the only way to start really getting a handle on this, on this problem. Water quality standards, um, is something that Rivers has typically taken a strong lead on and put a lot of focus on because it is important. It is sort of the foundation on the regulatory side of the Clean Water Act to be able to limit discharges of pollution in our waters in a way that protects what are called technically designated uses, but basically making sure that water is safe to recreate in, to eat fish out of, to, to drink from after conventional treatment. Um, this will, is we aren't expecting water quality standards changes in 2024 legislative session, but we are expecting the comment period on proposed revisions to the water quality standards to begin in spring, summer of 2024, and then it'll hit the legislature in 2025. So I just wanted to mention on uh, at this because We'll be, we'll be working with you all on getting the recommendations to DEP, the comments to DEP, to come up with some good revisions. And the two things that we're already starting work on is um, looking at uh, a redefinition of trout waters in the state 
and how they are listed. The current list within our water quality standards is sorely underrepresentative of trout waters in the state, which puts trout waters that should be protected or have enhanced protections at risk for not getting those. And it, with climate change and warming temperatures, it's ever more important to protect these sensitive cold water resources. So more on that to come. All right, I'm shifting to, I'm trying to run through this fast. We have a lot of time for questions and discussion, okay? <laughs> Coming back, but I'm gonna touch on some, but how am I doing, Marilyn? Am I, okay, I'm gonna try to start, stop at 4.30. Um, Clean Water Act. Um, so the definition, the Clean Water Act is based on a definition of, called the waters of the United States that determines which water bodies are subject to the, the jurisdiction, the authority of Clean Water Act. It has been highly controversial. It's kind of sort of swung back and forth. Um, and then we've got another big swing, not for the good. Uh, there was a challenge to the definition that over the summer came out. Nico, are you gonna talk about this at all? No, you're not, okay. Cause he's, he would, <laughs> he's the guy. <laughs> um, and I, there's a lot to figure out on how this is gonna affect West Virginia and the country. What, I, what I've been told by experts is that it could remove protections for up to 48% of water bodies nationwide. Very alarming statistic. Mainly wetlands. And this is from Kamein Valley, You're in this park, <laughs> are wetlands. And that if they are not determined to be immediately adjacent to a waters of the United States, if they're more isolated, uh, then they don't meet the definition. So this is very concerning. What's also concerning is that the Supreme Court opinion that came out in Sackett talked about, um, uh, what is it, Nico, nexus? a nexus of connectivity of some sort. So there's, there's questions about that we're very interested in, not only about wetlands, but headwater streams. So as you get higher in elevation, some of those streams you know, run in the spring more, certain times of war, they're intermittent or ephemeral, they're, they're seasonal. And there is question about the risk and the threats to those also not meeting the definition moving forward. So this could be, have a lot of implications for West Virginia and the nation and will continue to be talked about in Congress and probably through legal challenges as well. So an ongoing issue, but very important to our state. Um, okay, permit, <laughs> taking a deep breath. <laughs> so permitting reform, uh, Senator Manchin is the chair of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, which would be one of the committees leading discussions on permitting reform. And he has said time and time again that he wants to prioritize this. It can mean changes to um, key environmental laws, how, how public participation works, the length of time that assessments are done, the type of assessments that are done through the National Environmental Protection Act, NEPA. Um, you know, the, the interesting sort of balance that people are trying to find on permitting reform is knowing that we need to accelerate renewable energy development to meet the climate crisis but not do environmental harm across the board. So it's an interesting like tension on where, where do you find that balance? So I expect there will be more discussion around permitting reform in the next Congress. And then of course there is Mountain Valley Pipeline, which should, be an, should set off alarm bells for the whole country because this is a fairly unprecedented move to exempt a specific project, a specific company from key environmental laws. And in my opinion, the messages and the implications of this are, is that this, this Mountain Valley pipeline that was legislatively approved to be exempt from environmental laws is telling us as West Virginians that we are not worthy of equal protection under the law. And that's, I, I, it's hard to see the idea of, in my mind, like, why did this happen? How could this happen? But it feels like a perpetuation of this acceptance of West Virginia and Appalachia being an energy sacrifice zone 
and that somehow our ecosystem, our waters, our people are not deserving of equal protection under the law afforded to other places in the country. Nonetheless, the whole country, again, should be concerned about this precedent because it can happen here, could happen anywhere. So, um, Another thing um, happening right now that's really important is implementation of both the bipartisan infrastructure law, the bill, and the Inflation Reduction Act. And, and I think I see Perry Bryant's fingerprints on this, do I? Okay, you are so lucky to have Perry Bryant on this. He is a thought leader and dedicated to making sure that the IRA and its provisions are going to be well implemented in West Virginia. Um, and that will mean in our, the individual household programs that are highlighted in the booklet. It will mean a statewide grant to um, reduce greenhouse gas, uh, greenhouse gas reductions that the state has uh, signaled interest in. Um, it will also mean, um, just yesterday, uh, it was um, announced that West Virginia and the surrounding region is, was awarded a up to $9.25 million grant, grant, taxpayer money grant, to build what's called a, a blue hydrogen hub known as ARCH2 or the Appalachian Region Clean Hydrogen Hub. Uh, 925 million, so almost a billion dollars of public funds going in to develop this blue hydrogen hub, which blue means that the feedstock, the fuel stock they're using is natural gas. So it will mean more fracking, more pipelines, more pollution. And that what they have to, what they're saying they do with blue hydrogen is you take the carbon and you sequester it underground. So very large scale carbon um, capture and sequestration uh, that's never been tried on this type of scale in our region or our geography. Um, uh, just jumping back up to Bannon Minelands and Orphan Well Plugging, again, millions of dollars coming into the state to scale up on AML restoration and well plugging. Um, I am concerned about DEP's capacity. They're, they're the, the entity that will imp are, are implementing this program. Um, we have um, formed an AML work group, would invite anyone from Highlands to be a part of that if you're interested, and that is all about coordinating, collaborating, working with the agency on making sure we can make the biggest, longest impacts on this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity of this major investment coming out of the bipartisan infrastructure law to, to address legacy, this type of legacy pollution in the state. 30 minutes? Okay. Um, I'm gonna wrap up and then we're gonna open it up for discussion. Uh, Mike Jones, wave again, our public lands coordinator, who I hope you all get to know and has a table outside, uh, spearheaded our effort around a listening project on the Mon uh, National Forest. This is the cover of that, that uh, study, or yeah, listening project. Several recommendations came out of that. One, what, one of the most popular in subsequent community meetings and listening sessions we held since this report was uh, published was uh, headwaters protection. So one policy we're looking into is how to per at enhance permanent protections of headwaters within the Mon National Forest. One way to do that is a Wild and Scenic Rivers Act designation. Um, the, the good news on that is we already have made some progress. This was back in the day, so I can't take any credit for this. This was, I, some of you might have been involved in this with, with Rivers Coalition, but they, there was a eligibility study done that has found that, um, found that 12 segments in the Mon are eligible for wild and scenic designation and have been managed as such by the Forest Service. So there's a real opportunity to sort of take the next step, um, and that would require congressional de de uh, designation. I just want to give props to the Ohio River, because I don't, it's, I'm an Ohio River girl, I grew up there. <laughs> um, and it's, it's had a lot of 
pressure on it from industrialization, from toxics, from a lot of things, and it serves as the drinking water of five million people, the main stem does. But where we are sitting today, may be easy to forget all this water we're seeing out here, it's going to the Ohio. And I just want to um, uplift that I think we're making real progress on a Ohio River restoration and protection plan that should be released next, soon before the end of the year for public comment. And then it'll be released, uh, finalized and, and released, presented to Congress in 2024 to get the Ohio River Basin on the map for substantial federal investment in restoration. Again, watershed wide. So the idea is that the restoration funds would reach all, all the way up here into most of the mon that drains toward the Ohio. We have a similar program that has existed for some time for the Chesapeake Bay side, the eight counties in our state that float as Chesapeake Bay. Lots of funds, lots of money, lots of good things happening. That's not to this day been available for the Ohio River drainage. So we're fighting that fight to get the, the Ohio River folks and all this living on this side of the Continental Divide um, the attention and investment we deserve. Um, last thing I'll just mention is um, y'all signed on, thank you, Marilyn, to our, a letter to DEP commenting on their new, this is the first time they've ever taken this step, is they put out publicly draft public engagement guidelines. Some signal of an effort to how can we enhance better relationship communication, um, input into decision making that DEP makes every day that affect our everyday lives and those guidelines are posted on their website. The, comment, the official comment period just ended um, earlier this week, uh, but the DEP says they are committed to ongoing input from communities on how to better engage the public um, in, in these efforts of whether it be reviewing uh, permits or concerned about uh, certain sites, certain pollution, just better relationships. So, we're pleased that that seems like a step in the right direction, but again, my theme here, I think, yeah, water is political. You gotta stay involved, folks. You gotta be at the table, you gotta be in the room, and it's not that hard in a state like West Virginia. It really isn't. Man, you can walk in the Capitol and find your guy in the hallway, right? <laughs> then they're people. They're actually human, right? <laughs> They're human, so um, yeah, my email stuff, you can, if you're not signed up for our policy updates, we do water policy updates every week during the legislative session, and then as action opportunities come up throughout the year, that's the other thing to know. What clean water advocacy is not just during the 60 day session, it is year round. A lot of the proposals that get to the legislature go through a process, and it's important to be involved at every step of the process. So. I'm going to stop and hear what y'all have to say and ask and want to talk more about. Thanks.